It's 1980, a time when Star Wars sequels were good, but more importantly for the purposes of this video, Acorns Off was founded. If as a kid you had a BBC or a lowly Acorn Electron like me, Acorn Soft is a name jammed in your memory. It was the name on the box of the first piece of software you ever tried with your system. It was the first loading screen you ever saw. It was your first gaming experience. This gives Acorn users quite a connection to Acorn Soft. Part of it was they were the official Acorn software distributor, but also their games and applications had a quality feel to them that maybe other software houses just didn't. It was started in 1980 by David Johnson Davis and Acorn founders Chris Curry and Herman Hauser. Now some of you might be thinking it's rather odd for a computer company to start a software company. Well, it was not unprecedented at the time. After all, IBM, who is the biggest computer company in the world at that point, was as much a software company as it was a hardware one. Also, Amstrad did the same thing a few years later with Amsoft. The reason Acorn wanted their own software house was a computer needs software to be of any use. And with a whole plethora of new companies releasing machines, all of which were incompatible with each other, getting third party developer attention was not guaranteed. One of Acorn's key markets at the time was the university and laboratory sector, both were settings where a variety of computer languages were needed to propel sales, so compilers and interpreters would be required for a number of languages. There was also the newly released Acorn Atom that hoped to broaden their appeal to include the home market, so they need some games too. It was however Acorn's most successful machine, the BBC, where Aconsoft would see most of its sales. A lot of Aconsoft's initial games were their own versions of popular arcade titles like Pac-Man, Galaxian, Frogger, etc. Now these were not just cheap knockoffs, they were pretty good quality versions of these games, and helped Acorn sell a lot of systems. Acorn were not the only one doing this sort of thing. For example, the Spectrum had a Pac-Man-alike clone, Hungry Horus. Here we go. Now if you're thinking, oh that looks terrible, I'd, I'd agree with you. This is the Pac-Man clone created for the Acorn by Jonathan Griffiths. Now you can see they're worlds apart. I mean this shows you the effort Acorn Soft put into these. Here's their Frogger clone, Hopper. You might be wondering how they got away with all these clone games. Well, here's Paul Fellows, a former Acorn Soft developer, to shed a bit of light on it for us. Well, I, I remember lots of discussions with uh, the, the team at Acorn Soft and with David Johnson Davis about this sort of thing. And the situation then was, back in 1981-82, it was believed that the law of copyright did not apply to um, computer software in the same way that it is perceived to do today. Um, in particular, that uh, provided you hadn't actually taken a physical copy of the source or object code and uh, derived your work from that, that it was not possible to have intellectual property rights over the resulting game. That was the perceived legal advice at the time. But things were changing quite quickly, and the uh, law that was used to protect some of the games was not copyright, but trademark. People started registering the name of the game and or the graphic icons that they'd used within the game as registered trademarks of uh, various corporations. And hence, we weren't allowed to call it Pac-Man. From a game standpoint, they didn't just create must-have clones. Acornsoft also published games, some of which were fairly groundbreaking for the time, such as Aviator and Revs by Jeff Crammond, who would later go on to create Stunt Car Racer, The Sentinel and Formula One Grand Prix. The most significant of all the games they published was probably Elite. The open world 3D space combat trading game was a huge hit and for quite a while a platform exclusive for Acorn with the first version being released for the BBC Micro and then the Acorn Electron a few months later. Not every Acorn soft game was a hit, however. It did produce the odd game that was not so great. Um, take JCB Digger, for example. A JCB endorsed game that had, well, judder issues, to, to, to say the least. But part of that was to do with things JCB insisted on. Let's hear again from Jonathan Griffiths as to what some of those problems were. 
JCB Judder. Yeah. So initially, initially I wrote Rocket Raid. Uh, that was a we were in some of the other pubs nearby. Like Tim says, we would play Space Panic and we would also play um, Pac Man. And I remember Neil being very, very good at Scramble. So I could see all the le final levels, even though I couldn't play it that well. <clears throat> so I could never get that far. But Neil could, and so he could tell me all about it. And I could watch him over, over his shoulder <clears throat> to see how what it looked like. So I could then have a go at replicating it. Um, yeah, I was quite pleased with that one. And then flush with success from that, where I had the sideways scrolling working, I thought, I know, I'll do a one that scrolls up and down as well but I didn't really do it very well. The problem was I wanted to move. Moving sideways is okay because you're only moving two pixels because they're extra wide. And so it looks like four pixels normally. And that was fine. Uh, that's a whole character cell. <clears throat> but moving up and down four pixels is only half a character cell. The end result of this is that I wanted to move in four pixel increments to make it look smooth, <laughs> but it had the opposite effect. So that when you got near the top, it would uh, decide to scroll down by eight pixels because that's a whole character cell and that's all it could scroll as far as I knew. Yeah, and in fact, uh, Jonathan, the, the game Labyrinth uh, reprogrammed the screen to be only half the height and with only four pixels per character cell. And that was... Uh, yes, I remember goal, seeing that several, several pixels years later. And thinking, oh, if only I'd known how to do that. More, more use... Yeah, that was programming the 6845 rather more than I was... I knew about. I didn't at that point. I only really used the operating system's features, uh, or the, not operating system, the the ULA's hardware, and I hadn't really yeah, thought about. It. And I remember that uh, the JCB uh, people had a hand in all of this, didn't they? They did. Sponsored by JCB, and they kept insisting on various things like making the JCB itself a bit bigger, which just added to your problems of doing everything in a timely manner. That's right. The more pixels I was throwing around, the less time I had for doing the screen scroll. <clears throat> so it would start tearing at the edges if I wasn't careful. It was trying to do, if there were too many meanies on the screen at once and the, uh, yes, you were scrolling around, then uh, that was right on the edge of what it could handle. Another thing that JCB stipulated was that they didn't want their digger to be destroyed or broken in any way. And since they were co-funding this thing, uh, I... I did it and so at the end when the meanie captures you or just kills you the way it does it is by it jumps into the cab of the jcb and drives off and throws the the driver out but the jcb tractor uh the never JCB gets destroyed were harmed. exactly that's right they were quite keen on that perhaps understandably cool. and at the end i even got to drive around in one that uh, they went up to um Joseph Cyril Bamford in Oswestry or wherever it is, and uh, had a go for a, a day, which was great Blended. fun. One of the key advantages to having its own software house was Acorn could get software written to support some of its less common hardware. An example being the Acorn Electron. Initially, this did not get a lot of support, but Acorn Soft could get a number of its games working so they could be included as packing titles with the machine, most noticeably Snapper and Hopper. And of course, the text adventure from a third party, Countdown to Doom. They could also ensure new titles such as Elite would be available. The advantages did not just stop there. Acorn had someone to produce software compatible with its second CPU add-on for the BBC. The most common of these being the 6502, which is clocked at twice the speed of the original BBC 6502 and a whole 64k of RAM to itself, leaving the BBC 6502 free to deal with I.O. Mostly this was used by their languages and compilers and assemblers, and some of the applications. Although a version of Elite was produced that could take advantage of the second 6502, known as Tube Elite. This gives us probably the smoothest, nicest version of Elite for the 8-bit micros. The other processors available were the Z80, which let it run CPM, a 186 for a DOS-compatible-ish sort of a system, and National Semiconductor's 32016, so they could run Panos, an operating system written in Modular 2 that... I honestly have no idea what the point of it was. Aconsoft also got some advantages for being inside Acorn too. Most software development for the BBC was done on the BBC, rather than assembling or compiling it on a more expensive system. But this could cause some problems. Developers needed to be able to hold their assembly source code in memory, as well as have memory space for the version it was assembling, and the assembler itself. The second 6502 really helped with this, with its own 64k of memory. 
and with the onboard CPU being able to access the 32K built into the BBC itself. For some really complex pieces of code though, that was not enough, but Acorn had a secret weapon, the Turbo 6502. The Turbo was the second 6502, which then had a whopping 512K of RAM, and they had an assembler that could make use of it, through clever bank switching. This meant Acornsoft could build way more complex code than most people could, even with a second CPU. Acornsoft had a seven year run before MD David Johnson Davis parted company and Acornsoft became part of Acorn. Once part of Acorn, he got some interesting jobs. Working Acorn was continuing on their new ARM CPU and the system to go with it, with an external third party contracted to provide the operating system. However, the view was that the OS was taking too long to develop and some of Acornsoft's team were tasked with producing an OS based on the same lines as the original BBC OS. In a final meeting with Acorn's management, the former Acornsoft team's operating system was shown to perform a lot better than the alternative, and thus was selected as the operating system for the new machine. So with this OS now selected, the Archimedes line was launched with its new OS, Arfa, which when it came to the second version, which would have been called Arfa 2, got renamed to Risk OS, owing to the fact that a film sequel starring Dudley Moore, called Arfa 2, was about to be released at the same time. Initial sales of the Archimedes line did quite well, spawning multiple generations, but with dwindling sales of each generation due to competition with the PC, Acorn wound up its workstation division. But the ARM processor lived on, and went on to become the standard CPU of pretty much every smartphone, tablet, in fact more or less anything that's not x86. Acorn Soft staff even went on to pastures new, with Paul Fellows and Jonathan Griffiths going on to create the platform we now call Hive, that does your heating at home. And there's a little surprise for us there, which I'll let Paul tell us a little bit more about. You uh, alert me, which is the uh, stuff that's showing on the screen there now. And again, I've got Exhibit A, one alert me smart plug. That's right, uh, yeah. And these were, again, all sorts of very interesting little uh, devices using Zigbee radios. And every one of those devices that you see there has got an ARM processor in it. And oh, it's got an operating <laughs> system in it, um, written by Jonathan and myself. Uh, that didn't half look like a BBC Micro um, and was called DevOS for the uh, the devices and for mm -hmm. the, the large cube thing in the middle there, the, the hub, it's got one called Hubos. Exactly so. That's right, I, I have to correct you though, the, the, the hub indeed had an arm inside it. All the others had ZAP2 processors from Cambridge Consultants. You're right, they did, didn't they? Sorry. From the later versions, they had the ARM version. So the initial... The later versions yeah, went, went, went over to the ARM. But nevertheless, uh, assembly language programmed up mm -hmm. um, operating systems are us. And <laughs> that's the little energy display at the top right there that actually went out and was uh, shipped by um, British, British Gas. Gas. They gave away a million of those. So there's uh, that probably comes second in the list of... Uh, operating systems right yes indeed bbc like may be running very closely with the bbc micro itself i think there's probably about a million bbc's weren't there shipped really so many yeah something like that so uh actually uh, i think uh, you know these are the great grandchildren of the uh bbc micro well thank you all very much for watching I would like to thank the ABUG organisers who let me record these clips of the Acornsoft staff and Paul Fellows and Jonathan Griffiths for allowing me to use these clips. The whole of this Acornsoft reunion is available to watch on the ABUG website. I've included a little link in the description below. And if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to share it with others you think will like it too, as there's very little point in sharing it with people that you don't think will. And if you're feeling in a really generous mood, why not subscribe and do stuff for the bell? Because it really helps small channels like this one.